Hello, and welcome to the Still To Be Determined podcast, the podcast that follows up on topics from the YouTube channel Undecided with Matt Farrell. I'm Sean Farrell. I am a writer and the older brother of Matthew Farrell, and Matthew Farrell is here as well. Hello, everybody. Today, we're going to be talking about the truth about graphene. Finally, someone has the courage to talk about it. <laughs> Can't stop me, Sean. Can't stop me. This episode on YouTube was from May 26, 2020. I'm sure I just shocked Matthew by actually knowing the date of the episode. Yes. Yeah, I'm shocked, Sean. <laughs> we didn't have to pause to look it up. <laughs> Sometimes we like to pull out all the stops and actually look at the dates on the videos. So just before we started recording, Matthew started off with a, this is exciting. The SpaceX capsule just docked with the space station. Yes. So the launch took place yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I watched a, a couple of clips of the launch and the astronauts on their way across the tarmac and climbing the stairs to get into the capsule and sitting in the capsule. And it looks less real than a poorly made sci-fi movie. Yes, it does. <laughs> it looked like <laughs> somebody's cute attempt at making a space movie. And yeah. I thought, I thought, oh, look, they, they're dressed like astronauts. And, oh, isn't that cute? They've built a capsule. And then this thing lifts off. And now they've actually docked. And it really is, as you said in a previous episode, it's, it's a dramatic return to an American-based space program. Yep. And that's a really great thing. And the fact that it incorporates a company with a history now of thinking outside the box and figuring out better solutions to problems as opposed to just the sledgehammer approach of put more money and more research and more time on top of what already existed and actually reinventing the wheel when it makes sense. Um, is impressive, but I couldn't help but laugh a bit at, you mentioned in a previous recording that unlike the utilitarian yes. design of the U S space <laughs> program, this is Tesla fied. It's got nice interiors. Everything is smooth. It, it's Scandinavian design. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, it's the space capsule from Ikea as opposed to it being a space capsule. Exactly. And, I could not help but laugh at it doesn't even look real because of that. It's like it's the I, the image of what space exploration looks like is so deeply ingrained in me to look a certain way that when it doesn't look that way, it seems problematic. And I realized how much of my brain was echoing with that kind of dissonance uh -huh. when in the clip one of the astronauts had a purple dinosaur. Yeah. Did you see that part? No, I didn't. One of the astronauts had a purple dinosaur or dragon figure that was uh, covered with like glitter. And he subtly released it toward the camera that was filming them. <laughs> so this, and I couldn't help but think like, that must be a child's toy. Like yes. this, this guy must have a kid and he's doing this as a little like homage to his kid. I have no details other than having seen that image, but it was the moment that he let the toy go and it floats toward the camera that I was just like, Oh my God, this is real. Yeah. Like, Oh, they're weightless. There's no, <laughs> because there's no camera shake. There's nothing going. They're very subtly just like, they're just sitting there. Like, well, the, when they took off their in their outfits, their you know the pressure suits. Yeah, and then once they got the let's space, put they pressure took the, suits. Let's put pressure suits into quotes because those did not look like no. pressure suits. No, <laughs> but they took they took them off once they got into space, and so then it's just two dudes yeah. sitting in like slacks and polos. Yeah, and I tuned in. I, I tuned in and out over the course of the the launch, and when I tuned back in, and it was just these two guys. I was like, oh well, this must be footage from when they were training before they took off. 
Right. And then one of them like handed like a pen to the other one and it floated over to him. And I was like, oh, oh my God, this is live. Yeah. Why are they not in their suits anymore? Yeah. Why does this look like two guys hanging out in a living room? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> they're touching buttons on these gigantic touch screens. <laughs> it was, yeah. It, it did not look real at all. It was very, very cool. Yeah. And part of me can't help but think like you look at the interior of the older capsules and it's all, you know, it looks like it's all knobs and levers and springs and everything around them. And, and this is, like you said, touch screens. Part of me thinks, what happens if something goes wrong and the touch screen stops working? Like, well, there's, they've, they've got to have fail safe. Sure. They've they have got to have, they've but, have something in there. But from just an aesthetic perspective, I think, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. What if something goes wrong? because <laughs> at least on the utilitarian ship it's like oh something's not working well the lever's right there yeah just reach over and grab the lever and yeah those days are gone yep so uh dramatic dramatic changes exciting changes um but meanwhile back to the future of graphene i'm coming to this with the layman's knowledge of i remember reading about graphene when it was first discovered i remember the original discussion was oh these this you know somewhat two-dimensional thing can be turned into a tube shape and those tubes are extremely powerful and then the tubes can be woven together so you could end up with something that could be as thick as a spider's web yeah. thread but be stronger than a cable that holds up a bridge. Um, that's about the extent of my knowledge. Yeah. So. <laughs> it's, well, it's like with that as a starting point, let me, let me just jump off to a quick question. We're all familiar with graph fight. Yes. It is obviously related to graphene. That's how you make graphene. Right. For, so they're graphite. taking that's how you make graphene is with yes. graphite. Yeah. You graphite, use graphite to make graphene and you can actually make graphite. Well, so you're the, making graphene from graphite. Right. But you can also make graphite. <laughs> one of you're the, breaking, you're breaking my brain. <laughs> one of the, one of the, one of the portions of your video where you talked about, uh, the flash method of creating yes graphene are they effectively creating graphite through that process or are they are they skipping directly to actually graphene well they're they're making graphene so they're okay. not making graphite they're making graphene okay the so the process method. is one where they're they're creating it through a flash process they're creating graphene correct the reason i'm asking all of this is graphite a mind a mind product a mind mineral Yes. And is it with the evolution of graphene as a thing to be used, is it potentially going to be a mined material that could explode in cost and be a limited resource? Or are the processes like the flash production of it a way of, I thought that was fantastic and fascinating that you can take something like old rubber tires and plastics and actually create graphene out of them. But is this a mined material that is potentially like, oh, this is a limited resource and now suddenly no. it's going no. to be in uh, short supply? The, the best way to th think of it is, you know, we're carbon-based life forms. <laughs> Or you're Graph going way back to building yeah. blocks. This. Yeah. So no, but graphene is essentially a single layer of carbon atoms. Right. That's essentially what it is. So if you think of it that way, this is not a mine material we're going to run out of okay. because everything around us, there's so much in the world around us that's made from graphene. I mean, from carbon, including ourselves. <laughs> right. <laughs> so it's like, that's what the flash graphene process was, is they're basically taking materials that are rich in carbon and then they flash it with, you know, and basically fry it right, <laughs> in a split nanosecond. And then the carbon particles that are left can, basically are forming graphene. So it, it's, they're not using graphite to make graphene. 
Right. But the the graphite uh, discovery was that whole tape thing. It was yeah. like, okay, here's here's graphite, which is basically just like a block of carbon. Right. And if we start peeling off one atom layers of this stuff off of graphite, we end up with graphene. So that was the discovery. Right. But that's part of what's been, I don't want to put, I put this in air quotes, holding it back is that the manufacturing process of graphene is still very expensive and difficult. Right. And until we find ways to make it that are very affordable, it's not going to end up everywhere. Right. Because we already have ways of doing a lot of stuff in our world affordably. Like it's not going to replace our silicon in our computers because silicon is so cheap and easy to make. And we've perfected that so well until graphene becomes cheaper and easier to make than silicon. The benefits of a graphene processor over a silicon processor is not worth the extra cost. So right. it's like you're doing the same just, thing, but just a different way. So what's the point? Right. So what's the point? So until it becomes cheaper to make the benefits make sense. And then there's also things that where graphene makes perfect sense even today because the benefits really do make the cost worth it. And one of those things is like in batteries, it's like that, that company that was making that battery that, you know, charges in like one fifth the time and has a dramatically longer lifespan because they're using graphene in it. It's like, right. that, that seems like a, that's probably where we're going to see it first is, is probably batteries is probably where it's going to become most prominent first. And that's where you start to see things like the vision of the future where you have a device and you just never see it run out of power because the battery right. lasts for such an extended period of time. And if you incorporated that kind of battery with something like thinking in terms of like in a car, if there was a solar panel on the top of the car that would just continually refill that battery as necessary when it needed to charge, you would effectively would never think of in terms of, Oh, I'm running low on energy. Well, there's, there's somebody, after I put this video out, somebody shared another uh, YouTuber, this guy, I think he's in England that has created this graphene ink. And he just makes these videos showing all the different ways he's using graphene. And some of them are just mind bending. I mean, he took an old toaster oven <laughs> and removed, you know, the heating rods and he was converting it from AC electric to DC. So it could be used in like an RV. Right. And he was running this, he retrofitted this thing. So instead of using the heating elements that it normally has, he put some copper tape across the, let me just see if I can describe this. He took the outer casing off of the, the, the uh, toaster oven. And then on the inside that area, he put copper tape and then painted his, his uh, graphene ink over the entire thing, insulated it. And he ran electricity from a DC battery into those copper wires. And he basically is using his graphene ink as an, as a heating source with these copper wires that running off of DC. And he was able to get almost as much heat off of a, you know, a car battery as off of a 20 volt, 240 volt outlet. Holy it cow. was, it was, it was bananas. And he did it. He was like, this is amazing. I'm getting, you know, he's of course talking in Celsius because right. he's over in Europe, but he was like, talking about what he was getting off of two car batteries powering this thing. And it's like, that's the kind of stuff when you see that it's like mind blowing what's possible with graphene. And this yeah. is just a dude in his garage who made his own graphene ink. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like well, it, the, the science fiction aspects of this are what the, my video is like the truth about, because it's like, yeah, we've, we were all told about how the science fiction future, like we're going to have, ink on our clothes that'll be conductive and we can have electronics in our clothing and we can have electronics in our, you know, contact lenses and all this mm -hmm. crazy stuff. It's like, we are way far away from that. But in reality, what's happening is there's already stuff starting to show up today. That's, yeah. we're going to start seeing benefits from this. And isn't it very, true very that that sort of, yeah, the news runs with that kind of, um, exciting headline for most things like this. Yes. Yes. You know, they just run down the street yelling, guess what? Guess what? And in reality, it, it goes back to one of the first comments that stuck out in uh, beneath your video was from uh, Mr. Gonzanator. And he said, wonder material colon exists 
everyone, colon, I have 1 million ideas on how to use this stuff. Engineers, colon, how the heck are we going to make this stuff? <laughs> That's pretty much it in a nutshell, I think, is the, yeah. the ideas. Obviously, it's easy to run uh, wild with ideas of how this could be used. And then the engineers are left in the background saying, oh, we don't know how to do that yet. It's remarkable that a guy in his garage can actually come up with ink that could be used in that way. And, you know, I hope, I hope he's patented it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's entrepreneurs like that. It's, 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 you know, the, the, the mad genius in their garage, uh, working on something like that. I hope that somebody's the angel on their shoulder saying patent that idea. You need to protect yourself. I mean, it's, it's the whole reason I make these types of videos is, you know, I grew up watching TV shows, you know, like, you know, the science TV shows, the future of science and all these kind mm -hmm. of crazy things where they would basically say, you know, we're going to be flying our cars around everywhere That's right. in 20 Leonard years. Leonard Nimoy in search of. Right. Yeah. yeah. yeah and that when you live stuff. under the oceans. Right. And then of course we never got our flying cars. So part of the reason I make these videos is there's a part of me that's a futurist. I love this stuff, but I also understand there's a lot of nuance to it. And so mm. like my video about the million mile battery that Jeff Don's published paper and the news went nuts saying, you know, million mile batteries are here. And it's like, no, that's not what that research paper was about. Yeah. Uh, so it's like, it's an easy headline. And I like to try to break this stuff down in a way that, yes, there's a reason to be excited about it, but we have to temper that with reality. And in the graphene's case, there is a huge upside to graphene that's going to change our world over the next few decades. Yeah. And that's the key. It's going to take decades. It's not something that's going to be here tomorrow. And, but we shouldn't just write it off because we don't have it right right now right so it's like there's there's people that tend to fall on both sides of the spectrum and i was just trying to provide some of the context around it right as you were talking i kept flashing back to when we were the first time we went to epcot yeah and the what is it the world of tomorrow or the that giant sphere that you go into where it takes you spaceship through, earth yeah spaceship earth and it takes yeah. you through all the little dioramas with robotic uh, figures that are supposed to be the family that lives. There's the one daughter who lives in the uh, underwater station doing research in plant life. And then there's the family that lives on the space station. And then there's the, like, it takes you through all those little dioramas. Yeah. And I remember, you know, coming out of that when you and I first went to Disney and just being like, oh my God, wow. oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> yes. And, and then the last time we went through it, which was as adults and it was like, you know, this is over a multi, I think probably two decade long period where the last time I went through it and you were there as well. Cause I don't think I've ever been to Epcot without you. I know you've been there without me, but many, I've many never times. been there without you. And the last <laughs> time we went through it, we came out and I was laughing about the fact that you could now see, you could literally see cobwebs and yeah. dust on the animatronic figures. And it's like, nobody's going in and cleaning these things. Nobody. And, and now all of the stuff that they're promising is a mixture of, it actually came true and outdated. And well, to be, to be fair, to, to be fair to Disney, they have updated that, but in minor ways. In and minor actually, ways. Yeah. They yeah. actually just shut it down because yeah. they're actually retooling it dramatically. Right yeah. Now. And they have to, yeah. and it's things like, you know, when you, you know, when part of the fascinating future is the inclusion of people talking on massive flat screens where they can actually see each other while they have a phone call. Yeah, I know. And that as a futurist is now just like, okay, he's living on a space station future check. He's talking on an iPad. Okay. That's, that's now passe. So as you were talking about, as you were talking about all of the, you know, like the, 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 the way the headline is presented versus what can actually happen. We are constantly in a mix of something that's a year away, something that's five years away, something that's a hundred years away, something that might not be attainable. Right. And yeah. Epcot is the perfect example of that mix. You live that while you go through those rides and like, Oh yeah, I actually have a phone in my pocket that does more than what they're showing. Yes. And they're living in space. But so that's, it's that's this kind weird of the mix. Yeah, that's the kind of the point, though, is like, here's Spaceship Earth, which was this futurist look of like, 
look where we came from and look where we're going to be in the future. And a lot of that has actually come into reality. And that ride was originally created in the 80s. 30, 40 years in the future, a lot of this stuff actually did happen. So it's just, it's it's interesting how long it took to get there, but it did get there. And it's funny that you bring up Epcot because I've been watching on Disney Plus. I've been watching uh, their documentary series about uh, the Imagineering story, mm-hmm. which goes all the way back from the creation of the of Disneyland all the way up to today. And it's a fantastic series. And I'm a huge Disney nut. I go to Disney World a lot. I, the, in the ep- episode where they do- talked about the history of the building of Epcot. Um, they said something about how the whole vision was when they retooled it to what it became was about this futurist view and it was all about education and making education enticing and they wanted kids to come out of there excited about the future and the future potential that's around us. Right. And when they said that, it, something clicked in my head and was like, oh my God, this is why I started the YouTube channel I did. This is why I'm talking about all the stuff I did. It all goes back to that because I remember going there when we were, I was like, what, 12 or something like that? You were probably, yeah. what, 15? Yeah. Epcot was my favorite park because I walked out of there like vibrating with excitement around technology and the future and what right. we're, we're going to do. It's so sci-fi and so cool. Uh, I remember the ride Horizons. I used to love that ride. Yeah. Uh, it was, it got me so excited and that's the root of, I think, why I talk about the stuff I talk about, like graphene. It's right. like this, that's the whole reason I'm doing this kind of stuff is because I get so excited about the potential that's behind all these new discoveries that we're doing. But at the same time, I'm a realist. Right. <laughs> so I want to keep things in check. I don't want to get too, too out of control excited. Yeah. Some of the things that you talk about in the video that are like 3D printing seems like the obvious marriage between. Yeah. Graphene and how would it be used what what would the actual use of it look like and 3d printing seems like the obvious choice where if you could take something like you know, just off the top of my head i was thinking like imagine having a car where something starts to fail a part starts to fail and you pull into a garage and they can just 3d print you a replacement part yep you know something like that where it, it doesn't have to be things wouldn't have to be made out of steel or cast iron anymore they could actually be potentially stronger and lighter because they could be 3d printed out of out of graphene um or even something along the lines of of you know talking at the beginning of the podcast about the space travel um the ability to make components for all of that that are lighter than the materials that would have been used 50 years ago Mm -hmm. dramatically lighter and stronger and the potential for what that means for safety and also efficiency. And it's really kind of remarkable. There's another YouTube channel that I stumbled upon recently called uh, subject zero science. I think it's the name of the channel. And they had an episode where they broke down how strong is graphene. Cause you often hear things like it's a hundred times stronger than steel. And he basically broke down. What does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. Because you hear, different reports as to how strong it is and he broke down the actual math behind all of it and he ran through a calculation for like okay so let's look at the golden gate bridge and you know the cables in a suspension bridge and the cables of a suspension bridge are made up of bundles of smaller cables Mm -hmm. so it's like tiny cables that are bundled together and then it's bundles of the bundle so when you're looking at that giant cable on the golden gate bridge it's actually made up of like dozens of smaller bundles which were made up of tiny individual strands Mm -hmm. and he did the math and it came out that the suspension bridge the golden gate bridge with graphene the amount of graph the size of the cable of a graphene cable that would be able to suspend the same amount of weight would be one single of the strands that's inside of the bundles (laughs) So you have right now, like however wide those cables are, you know, like they're X feet around. Yeah. yeah. It's like a graphene one would be like a centimeter. Right. (laughs) It would be able to hold the same amount of weight. And it was just like, when you look at it, when when he did that, it was like, it kind of put in perspective of like a, oh my God, that, that is right. This really is going to be game changing once we figure out how to manufacture it cheaply. (laughs) And I would, and I would point out that you mentioned that, uh, was it the flash technique that you said, uh, 
the researchers at Princeton are envisioning being able to get one kilogram a day. And the thing about the weight of the graphene is it's super lightweight. So right. when you say there's like a kilogram, it's actually, that's quite a lot. <laughs> that's what I was thinking is initially yes. I was like one kilogram is nothing. And I, I did the conversion because I always, when it comes to metric, um, I know that those numbers mean things, but my American brain like yes. goes full speed into a brick wall. And I'm just like, well, oh, one kilogram. And I'm like, okay, I have to, it's 2.2 pounds. Yeah. So yeah. once I did that and I thought, oh, it's only 2.2 pounds, that's nothing. Uh, you know, like I've got exercise weights that are 2.2 pounds and, and I'm like, that's, that's next to nothing. But then when you keep in mind, like, oh, this cable for the suspension bridge would only have to be one thread. Yeah. Uh, suddenly it's like, oh, two pounds is a lot. And to get a sense of the volume, there was a, I think it was the verge had a video on graphene once that I saw and they showed uh, a company that's manufacturing this stuff. And he had, you know, like an oil drum sized container that was had like you know like a 50 gallon like black bag in it and with one hand he pulled the entire bag out <laughs> and it was just full of graphene right and it looked like it took no effort to pull it out of the drum so right. he pulled he pulled out was what was probably a kilogram of graphene <laughs> right in a gigantic black bag <laughs> it was just like yeah. okay this stuff is super lightweight <laughs> I, I do wonder two things about the flash technique, which is mm -hmm. you end up with two pounds, roughly one kilogram of at the end of the day, you end up with one kilogram of graphene. I wonder how much ingoing material that represents. Yeah. Like I don't, I, I just, because part of question. me, yeah, part of me thinks like if this is a solution, to a recycling question like yeah and you know when, when you like a city like new york city we 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 have these conversations um a lot here in the city which is we have a recycling program and it's fairly robust it could be better in some ways but it's fairly robust but what does actually happen with all that plastic and all that glass and like, is it legitimately able to be reused and is it, what's the efficiency there? Right. And is something like this a potential way of saying like, oh, it's, it can be reused in this dramatic way where if you can use a mixture of plastics and old rubber and be able to convert it into this, how much is going in and how much is coming out? You're coming out with a roughly two pounds. Is that 20 pounds or more of in, yeah, in a, going material. 100 pounds in two pounds out it's yeah. Like, what, what which, it? yeah which if that's the case i don't have a problem with that to say <laughs> like oh getting rid of 100 pounds of old rubber tires i i currently live next door to uh no joke a tire shop and it is old rubber tires i see them working on them every day and i think like all that uh vulcanized rubber like what what will yeah. happen with that that is a that is a uh, environmental burden now for yes, generations. Yes. But if it could be converted into this kind of thing and actually taken away in that way, like I would, you know, it's kind of laughable to think, are we looking at a future where we're plagued by having too much graphene? Um, <laughs> the other question I have around the flash technique, I have two more questions past that first one. How much energy goes into the process? Yeah. Because that... I the yeah. temperature that they reach, even though it is literally for, you said it was milliseconds, yes. is such a high temperature. I wonder what the energy use to get that is. So energy consumption is a big question mark there. Because if you can't do it cheaply mm -hmm. because of energy use, then that becomes another hurdle for the entire process. And the third question I have around the flash technique is once you do that flash, does somebody have to go, oh, he is a miracle? <laughs> yes. You have one of the grad students behind you that has to yell that every single time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, who's that? That's Gary, the intern. That's his job. <laughs> yeah. That was a really bad joke, Sean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I walked really slow to get there. I'm really proud. Yeah, and I loved it. I loved yeah, it. Thank I'm really you, proud. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, there was also... 
one of the things that stood out in your video was the organ transplant section where you talked about mm -hmm. how graphene acts as a barrier uh, against infection and um you're talking about the the scene with the giant smiley faced cell yeah i wanted to bring that up in particular because what i love about it is in the corner it actually says you've got this it's this gigantic red happy face yes and then to the left of it is an is a smaller uh is there a face on the smaller circle as well yes there's a yeah and then and but the best part of that entire thing my, the first time i watched the video it was the, just the faces that caught me and made me laugh but the second time i watched it was the fact that it says in the corner not to scale, yes. <laughs> which I love the idea that the problem with that image is not the faces. The it's problem the is scale. that this is not to scale so that in your body, you've got, you know, you just had an organ transplant and in your body somewhere in a very, very small way <laughs> is, a little, is, is a gigantic smiley face and a smaller smiley face. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love I love that aspect of, I mean, that's all futuristic stuff that they're talking about, but it it's it's been proven to to work. And what's fascinating about that specific thing, I don't know if I came across, was that human cells are dramatically bigger than bacteria, which is why this works. Because when a human cell hits these little spikes, it doesn't impale itself because it's too big, right? And you're talking about little spikes that are you know an atom thick. <laughs> few atoms tall it's right. just big enough to kind of tear apart a bacteria but it's way too tiny for a giant object that just kind of brushes against it so it doesn't hurt human cells at all but it, it basically just destroys any bacteria that runs into it that's so freaking cool that is so <laughs> yeah <laughs> such a simple solution to a complex problem and dramatically uh life-saving yeah, you especially think if you about don't have the to take number of the drugs. People to, yeah. yeah, just think about the number of people that that would have a positive impact on. Is really, it's really remarkable. And the other medical, like you talked about that in particular, but I'm sure there will be other discoveries from everything from the things that might be put into a human body to help the person's body function, but also the tools used to get into the body. I imagine you think about yeah. some of like the filaments and things that are used in certain procedures to do microsurgery. And if those tools were developed out of graphene, they could potentially be even smaller. Or even to things that are very practical for anybody, not even just through doctors and medicine, but like uh, I, I brought up desalination in the video, but even water purification because... Yeah they can make basically like sieves for water out of sheets of graphene that remove all impurities. Right. And it's like, it would be dirt cheap to manufacture like little bottles that you just, you could literally drink water, you let water. it drain through and you've right. got pure water. It's right. like, imagine third world countries that have, you know, or any country that has not clean, like Flint, Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean, it's like it would make it so much easier for every person on the planet to ensure that they have pure drinking water. Right. In an affordable way. So in the comments, other than the one I already shared, I, I, there was one quick one that I think was a, a good wrap up of a lot of this. And it was from Greg Weber. And he simply said, this sounds like aluminum before it was learned how to cheaply make it. Yeah. And I think that was that was one thing that kept echoing in my head as I was watching it the first time was mm -hmm. all of this seems the same as if in the late 19th century, you said to people, imagine a material called aluminum. And here are the things you can do with it. And it would have sounded like it would have been science fiction to them. So I there, think it's a the good, other thing that came to mind analogy with the other thing that came to mind with that uh, comment is the movie the graduate yeah plastics yeah you know what i mean it's, yeah. it's we're basically at that moment right now, now he's with somebody going graphene. graphene yeah yeah another comment that popped out was from john farrier and i don't know if you saw this one but it's from just a couple of days ago and he wrote hello few notes i do graphene research with cvd the main issue for a lack of manufacturing with products we want is because growth tends to only yield small flakes of varying thickness there's a ton of small flakes, 
but we want large sheets so they can be used for electronics. But that's incredibly difficult. The yep. things shown only use flakes and the flash technique only creates flakes, which is good yep. if that's what you need for some reason. But the most important breakthrough will be when large sheets of the single layer pristine graphene are produced. Many people are working on this, but no one has really been too successful on it. Maybe your next video can include the roller sheets of graphene production. I think MIT did that one. Heck, maybe my technique will be in your next graphene video if I'm lucky. Smiley face. <laughs> so I thought That's that awesome. was I thought that was an interesting interesting comment directly from somebody who's working in this field directly. Um, yeah, I should have brought that up in the video because I did know I didn't know specifically some of the things he mentioned, but I did know like the flash graphene is the flakes. I did know that, and it's it's like the cheap, inefficient, not useful in every graphene situation type of graphene. Mm -hmm. I did know that, but. I, I was trying to hit the, uh, the main point was manufacturing's hard. We're still figuring it out. Yeah. And I didn't want to get too into the weeds, but what he brought up is fantastic. That's a, yeah. that's a really great insight. Yeah. So you might want to go look for John's comment. Yeah. I didn't and, see that uh, one. And reach out to him because he's have somebody who's, who's, uh, doing it elbow deep in the, <laughs> yeah. in the actual product. And, and yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. So, uh, a lot of a lot of different um, opportunities and developments in in this field. But what do you, the listeners, think about all of that? Uh, let us know. You can reach out to us through Twitter at Still TBD FM. You can reach out to me at by Sean Farrell or Matt at Matt Farrell, and he's also at Undecided MF. Be sure to watch the latest videos from Undecided with Matt Farrell on YouTube. And you can find the podcast at stilltbd.fm. You can subscribe. You can do that through iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, any place where podcasts are available. You can give us a rating. You can review. And you can share us with your friends. All of that really helps the podcast. The podcast then helps the channel. The channel helps Matthew. And then Matthew helps me. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll talk to you next time.